thanks everybody for coming. And I'm honored to be here, actually. Uh, I have to say, uh, first, how much I appreciate this, this movement. Um, and so, I wanted to say first that I think that it's extremely important what you all are doing, obviously. Uh, I don't know if it's obviously, but I think it's already become a historic social movement, in a sense. Like, it's already accomplished a lot, and it has potential to do a lot more. And obviously, we don't see that in terms of like, political change. As we have to do. But uh, the fact that the mainstream politicians and a good part of even the media has had to. Uh, Okay. <laughs> talk about it. I can shout like Chavez. Um, the, okay, so uh, the, the fact that you have mainstream politicians, democratic politicians, having to say, having to recognize this movement have to recognize its legitimacy and the legitimacy of its demands is really historically unprecedented, I think, this fast. If you think of all the years it took the civil rights movement uh, to get to that stage where they would be recognized, or the uh, movement against the Vietnam War, or really any movement uh, that I can think of, any social movement, it really took a long time, it took years, you know? And I think that says something about how the movement has captured the imagination of the people in this country. And it's partly because, well, first, I think because uh, it's got moral clarity, which is always extremely important in a movement. Uh, second, it's the first really mass movement uh, based on economic issues that you've had since the Great Depression. So we don't have real, I mean, if you look at the other social movements that you would compare it to, the anti-war movement was about a war that was going on far away. And the civil rights movement was about something here, but it wasn't economic. Uh, so it didn't directly affect everyone in the same way. And uh, so I know I'm saying this uh, because I think it's important, you know, all kinds of groups that you know most people never heard of the students for a democratic society the student nonviolent coordinating that you know transformed this country uh, never really got the long-term recognition that they uh, deserve and that could happen here too but you are still changing the the country and the world so that's the first point I wanted to make, and um, and I think it's, that's why I think this is so important. Now, in terms of situating it, I want to say just a few words about where I think this, where we are right now in, in U.S. history, with an economic angle, of course. Um, you know, this country was moving to the right. Uh, from about 1968 on. Uh, so for almost 40 years, we really moved to the right. And that was true even during the Clinton year. In fact, uh, you know, after Clinton got NAFTA and the World Trade Organization and welfare reform, there wasn't even that much left for Bush to do uh, in terms of structural changes that you could do that is structural negative, regressive structural changes in the United States that could be done. He tried to go after Social Security, but that wasn't possible because a sixth of the country is time getting... Time bank, uh, kitchen, time bank, anybody who thinks the time bank... Okay, kitchen. thank you. So that, so that was part, you see, you know, these were changes that really helped redistribute income in the wrong uh, direction towards the 1%. Okay. And uh, and they were very important. They were structural changes. You know, uh, Bush started a war that killed a million people, and 
that was horrible, maybe more horrible. Uh, on the other hand, he didn't really change the country uh, as much as Clinton did uh, in terms of these, these structural changes. Uh, that's not to say one's worse than the other, I'm just comparing the different effects. And uh, so it's true that the Clinton years were, you know, part of the largest economic expansion in the history of the United States. And you had a big stock market bubble that drove that, and then when that burst, it was, it was replaced by a housing bubble. And you had some changes in the policy of the Federal Reserve that made a difference as well in the second half of the 1990s. So you did get, in the, in the second term, Clinton's second term, you did have some rising wages, you had low unemployment. And so it doesn't look at, you know, you look at the country today, it looks pretty good. But I want to emphasize that as, in terms of the changes, the structural changes that determine the distribution of income in this country and determine a lot of the politics, and of course set the stage for the financial crisis, not to mention the Iraq War, uh, that was Clinton, okay? Uh, so that was a right-wing period, 40 years almost. I mean, I would actually say the turning point was 2006. That's, but either way, you can say 2006 or 2008. I do think we've reached a turning point in the sense that that era is over, okay? And uh, it doesn't so much look like it because the Obama administration has mainly continued policies of prior administrations, okay? And overwhelmingly has, and especially on foreign policy, which I'm going to get to. But, uh, oh. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, but it was, I, I think the era is over because I think that that was stopped. In other words, you're not going, I don't think you're going to see in this country, even if Obama loses the presidency, whatever, the Congress, you're not going to see what you saw for those 40 years. We reached a point where that movement, that rightward movement is, is really over. It still has a base, it's got a media, it's got the House of Representatives, but it's not, a, it's, it's not what it was. It's really gone. And so, to me, what I think is uh, inspiring about this movement is you're providing the leadership that the country lacks. In other words, the country has, has finally gotten out of this right-wing uh, era which lasted so long, but the lead, there's no leadership to take it in the direction that it needs to go. So it's not going anywhere. And this is, what I see is this movement is going to provide that leadership. Whether it comes up with a set of concrete demands or not, doesn't matter. The point is, it's there, it's, it's, it's calling attention to the problems in a way that wasn't done before. And it's going to force political change, regardless of what organizational form or demands that it takes. So that's my optimistic view of what we see today. Okay. Now, um, can I just then say something? Sure. I, you know, I, uh, one thing is uh, one of the major changes that occurred was like around the 70s. You had the, uh, the oil crisis. A lot of people point to, to that as a big demarcation. and. You know, we had 70% of the economy was industrial, and there was a big shift where all the plants were being shut down by, you know, uh, you know, uh, and sent to to uh, other countries for cheap labor and and uh, you know to exploit uh, the fact that they didn't have environmental protection. And I actually was working in a factory in Milwaukee for 17 years, from 19. Uh, 73 until 1990, and when I got hired, there were 8,000 people. That place is a shell now. Which one was that? A.O. Smith. It made, okay. uh, you know, it, it was opened in 18, the late 1800s as a bicycle frame factory, and, uh, you know, they were making car frames and truck frames for all the big uh, auto plants, and it was an employer of working class people. About 50% of the people working in the plant were um, minorities, and they were able to send their kids to college, the American dream, you know, and you know, and uh, uh, have homes. And what happened, you know, in, uh, in terms of the deemployment of, of folks, 
is they were now forced to work at Target and Walmart, you know, for a non-living wage. And, uh, you know, I, I really look at um, one of the points of demarcation was when Reagan got elected and he smashed um, the air traffic controllers in 1980. You know, so at the same time, you had all these family supporting jobs, union jobs being shipped overseas and people being forced into low paying jobs at Target and Kmart. You know, then you had this like major challenge to the labor movement and the unions basically didn't stand up to it. And, you know, I think that's been a big factor in, in the transference of wealth. Because yes, yeah. when you had strong unions, you know, in the, you know, just one last point, when I was in the plant, we had wage increases, we got 30 and out pensions, we got a dental plan, we even got a cost of living allowance, and all of that was wiped out in the 80s. And, you know, today, people don't, you know, went from something like 80% of private sector jobs having a defined pension today, it's less than something like 30 or 25%. So, you know, I mean, I'm not as optimistic as you about, you know, the uh, the line that we're moving, going to be moving against, uh, you know, the right wing. They're not going to give up, up power without a serious fight, and they've got both the Democrats and the, you know, I agree with you, both the Democrats and the Republicans you know, are, are, you know, bought up by the corporations, but it's going to take a huge movement like we saw in Wisconsin of people in the street to turn it around. Well, thanks for that. I, I think, uh, what's your name? Jonathan. Jonathan. So, Jonathan filled in a lot of the history uh, that was, is, is extremely important. I mean, that's how it happened. That's how these structural changes happen. Uh, the firing the air traffic controllers, uh, was one of the first things that Reagan did after he took office, and that was the beginning of the weakening of labor. Uh, that, you know, well, some of it began, as you said, in the, in the late 70s, but uh, it really accelerated to the point where uh, labor doesn't have anywhere near the union membership or the bargaining power uh, that it had in the first half of the post World War II period. And, uh, so, you know, for the first half from 1946 to 1973 or so, uh, you had wages grew with the economy for the most part. And uh, so you had a different uh, structure. Uh, and now, as you know, I'm sure any number of people have already mentioned this, you know, most of the income gains in the last uh, 25 years at least have gone uh, to the richest, uh, well, the, at least the 10%, and a lot of it to the to the 1%. And so that was, those were the structural changes. I mentioned them in terms of legislative changes, the World Trade Organization, the NAFTA. Uh, the labor law, I mean, labor law didn't change so much as the practice changed. What, what, what Reagan did was he made it possible now for employers to just fire workers massively when they went on strike, which wasn't the practice prior to him. So this is, this is, these are all the part of the structural changes that have taken place in this country that have brought us to the point where, you know, the 99% is in the streets. And uh, I agree also with Jonathan that it is a long battle. We're pretty far from change still. Uh, but what I was emphasizing was that I think the right wing era, where the major economic changes all go in one direction, that is, they redistribute income upward, they take power away from the vast majority. I think that era is the one that's over, and unfortunately the same people are still in control, and so that's why I see this movement as having important leadership. Now, I don't know how much people want me to talk about, the, you know, the, I think most of you know about the redistribution of income, about unemployment, uh, about uh, you know student indebtedness, the job market, and things like that. The one issue, uh, you know, uh, a couple of issues on that I just want to emphasize because they're not as, as well known. I, first of all, you know we have 9.1% as the official unemployment rate, and of course if you count the 
people uh, that are un underemployed involuntarily, working part time, who want to work full time, people who have dropped out of the labor force because they can't find work. It's it's about 16 and a half percent, which is pretty close to a record, uh, you know, and uh, since these statistics have been kept. And so this is very bad. But there's also a, uh, a, a big differential uh, by, uh, by race. Uh, white unemployment is 8%, not that far from the whole average, but African American unemployment is 16%, so it's double. Uh, African American youth, it's 44%. Uh, percent. Uh, that's ages 16 to 19. The, you see also these disparities by race in terms of wealth. Wealth is the biggest. I mean, the wealth ratio, the median wealth of white uh, families is, or households, is uh, about 20 times that of black households for 2009, which is the latest data. And uh, it's about 18 times that of Latino households. Um, Income is also uh, vast disparity. Uh, the ratio, uh, so the, the typical uh, median black family has about 61% of the income of uh, the uh, median white family. So this is a huge part of the uh, reality that we're looking at. It's, it's, it's much worse uh, for uh, African Americans especially and also Latinos. Uh, that, uh, than it is um, overall. And that's something we always have to keep in mind because, you know, race is an issue that politicians don't like to talk about, except for, of course, when they use it in coded ways. Uh, and, and, and that's something I guess I, I should mention as part of this 40-year white right-wing drift. A big part of that was what the, is called the Southern strategy the Republican Party used from uh, the Nixon presidency on, from around uh, 1970, which was to uh, was to use race uh, to uh, make sure that the Democratic presidential candidate never got a majority of the white vote again, and that's been true all the way since 1964. And so uh, uh, that's important to keep in mind. When you're looking at this politics, politics of, of what we're dealing with and how we're going to go forward, because those, uh, those issues have to be uh, taken on, and they're going to be taken on within the movement because they're not going to be, uh, by this kind of a movement, because they're not going to be, the politicians are going to be uh, much more reluctant uh, to, to address those issues, those, those par that part of the gross inequality that has gotten worse country. Um, so uh, there are all kinds of structural reforms that I could also talk about uh, that most of you probably already know about. The financial transaction tax, for example, or financial speculation tax as we call it, which would be a, a tax on uh, stocks and bonds, uh, derivatives trading, that would, you know, could generate a lot of revenue and also reduce a lot of the activity that is really is, uh, negative. Okay, I mean, everybody recognizes now, even a lot of conservative uh, economists recognize the financial sector is too big. This would have the advantage of reducing the size and generating, with even a very small tax, you know, $100 billion a year in terms of revenue. Another real reform that we've uh, pushed a lot is uh, job sharing because we're uh, or work sharing is you know we're still far from winning uh, you know I should say very clearly that the situation we're looking at could be resolved quite easily by our government okay you know, the whole crisis that we're looking at uh, the unemployment is really caused by a lack of private demand and that's because of the collapse of the housing bubble that's what really caused it you don't see that that much because the media has focused on the financial aspects of it more. But it, it, you know, the truth is uh, that you had a, a huge real estate bubble, $8 trillion housing bubble, and that burst, that kind of guaranteed what we're looking at right now, regardless of what happened with derivatives or uh, the mortgage sector or anything else. I mean, that uh, caused 
he was the, you know, we lost about four percentage points in GDP in construction, and we lost about that much also in spending by people who had lost housing wealth. Those are the two things that brought us to where we are, and the government, the federal government had a stimulus, as you know, uh, but that was only about one-eighth of the demand that was lost in the private economy. So that's why we have the unemployment we have today. And they could, they could correct this. There's any number of ways they could do this, but they don't. So that's very important to keep in mind. I mean, that's why you have mass demonstrations all over Europe and the Eurozone. That's why you have people in the streets here, because the government is not doing the basics that it would need to do in order to bring us to full employment. Now, in the meantime, of course, there are other things that can be done. And the one I want to mention in particular is work sharing, because that actually worked in Germany. They have unemployment of 6%, which is lower than it was even before the recession. And that's because they basically pay uh, employers to keep people working at reduced hours, but not a complete reduction in pay. That is, the pay is not reduced as much as the hours. And that is one way that you can, uh, you can mitigate unemployment at a time like this if we can't win the obvious solutions of the government simply reconstructing this society and, or at least spending the money to partially reconstruct our economy. And by the way, this has enormous environmental implications too because if you reduce work hours over time as Europe has done, you also reduce energy consumption. So Europe, uh, what's, what's known as old Europe, has about half the energy consumption per person that we have here. And a good part of that is due to the fact that they have taken their productivity gains in the form of reducing hours rather than simply consuming more. Okay? And that's very important. So I think that's something that you know, if the environmental movement and other groups were to get on board, that's potentially winnable in the United States. Now, I could go through other ones, but I, I, I want to uh, I want to talk about another part of the challenge that we face. Uh, because, as Jonathan said, you know, we have a long battle ahead of us, and I think one of the challenges that we have that a lot of countries don't face is that the United States isn't just a country, it's an empire, okay? We have hundreds of military bases all over the world, and we have wars, and we're bombing at least six countries right now, and, uh, and this is under Obama. And just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the president said with respect to Iran, all options are on the table, which is code for saying that we are threatening military action against you, okay? And that's a very serious and I think irresponsible thing to say, but it's part of the uh, foreign policy of this administration. That is to threaten uh, Iran, which poses no uh, real security threat uh, to the United States, just like Iraq posed no uh, significant uh, security threat to the United States. So we have a very different uh, situation and it affects us in several ways. One, of course, is the budgetary part of it. We're spending, if you count all of our security spending together, it's close to a trillion dollars now, you know, including Homeland Security and everything else. Now, some of this is legitimate security needs, but most of it isn't. And even the part that's legitimate uh, is, you know, as big as it is because we're killing people all over the world. We wouldn't have such a Homeland Security problem if we didn't have this empire uh, problem. And a lot of people understand that. In fact, they, you know, uh, close to a majority of people uh, polled recently actually thought that, uh, that the attacks of September 11th had something to do with our foreign policy. Imagine that. They had to get that themselves because they never saw that in the last 10 years, uh, you know, in the media. And uh, so uh, this is something, why do I think this is so important? Well, this is something I care about. But it's also important because if we're talking about changing this country, it's going to be very hard to do that. If we're talking about getting something from the 99%, it's going to be very hard to do that while we still have an empire. In fact, it's not even clear at this point because we're so far from change whether it's going to be possible to win anything.
before we become a normal country instead of an empire. And so that's something that we all have to think about. And, you know, Martin Luther King, to take an example, he understood this really well. And, you know, in 1967, one year before he was killed, he made his speech, his famous uh, Time to Break Silence speech, where he came out against the Vietnam War and he said, we're not going to win the war on poverty until we stop this war. And he denounced the war in clear moral terms. He didn't just say, you know, we're not going to win or it's costing too much money. He said, this is wrong what we're doing there. It's horrible. It's a crime. That's how he denounced it. And he called on people to resist the draft. And, you know, he got a terrible reception, by the way, from the media across the country. They all like him now. But when he was alive and saying these things, they, uh, they really disrespected him for saying this. But he said it because it was important uh, for moral clarity, for the movement that he was leading. And he also realized that it was important to the goals that his movement and he wanted to accomplish. And I think this is even more true today because, you know, in the 1960s, we got Medicare and Medicaid, the two most important programs that have reduced poverty and improved people's lives in this country. And we got huge increases also in Social Security that reduced poverty among the elderly uh, drastically. And we got that while we were, while our military was, you know, involved in a horrible war killing uh, people in Vietnam. And I don't think that that's going to happen going forward. I think the circumstances have changed to the point where uh, it's going to be almost very difficult or even impossible for us to win uh, the kind of things we want uh, to get more than cookies or crumbs. <laughs> to take an example from our guest, uh, without doing something about this the empire uh, problem. Now, one of the reasons that's true is not just the budgetary part of it, uh, but there's also the empire as what I would say a, uh, a weapon of mass distraction. Uh, and you could see this. Thank you. I'm, I'm not really hungry. That's the uh, you could see this in 2002 when the Bush administration used the Iraq war to take all uh, of the issues that people really cared about most out of the press and out of the election. Okay, And there are people, and I'm one of them, I have to say, worried that Obama could do the same thing uh, you know, with, the, with Iran. I mean, why are they doing this stuff now? All of a sudden, this used car salesman. Uh, who couldn't seem to do anything right, conspires with a DE, uh, a, a U.S. federal uh, DEA agent to uh, to get Mexican drug cartels to assassinate the Saudi ambassador. That's it. I mean, not a very believable story to begin with, but even if it's true, this is, you know, or some part of it is true. I mean, why is Obama talking about all options being on the table? You know, this is clearly a political thing, and no matter how you look at it, and so this, obviously, you don't have to necessarily go to war in order to distract people uh, from the issues that, that should matter in an election, but it can lead to a war uh, very easily. You know, Bush got everything he wanted before they even fired the first missile uh, because uh, that's how they got both houses of Congress in 2002. And, but he went to war anyway. Once the momentum builds for war, it's very hard to stop. And once the war starts, as we can see after 10 years of Afghanistan, it's very hard to end the war. So that's why I think that if this movement is going to uh, succeed, it's going to have to address those issues too. It doesn't have to address every issue in the world, I'm not saying, or every issue that I care about. But it has to, uh, it's going to have to deal with that because uh, otherwise everything uh, can be derailed even when it gets uh, much bigger. Okay, why don't I leave it there and see what you all uh, really want to talk about and we can discuss uh, any of the issues that I've raised uh, or that you want to raise in, in, in greater detail. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is David. Thank you, Mark, for coming here. It's really great to have you here and to um, hear your perspective on these things. Um, 
One thing you didn't mention, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about, is the fact that um, while you did basically say in different words that what's different about these past few years compared to the past 40 years is that now our side is basically starting to fight back. Um, I well, think, I think it's more than that. I think, you know, if I could make a comparison to Latin America, for example, where in South America you had elections in Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Uruguay, Paraguay. You know, all these countries really changed. They have left governments now. The whole region has changed. And I think a similar thing happened here in 2006 and 2008 is basically you had this whole kind of neoliberal experiment. It failed over a long period. And people just had enough of it. I think it reached that point where it, it actually swung the election. And it was different effects in the different countries, South America, America but it, it, it basically hurt the 99% a lot. And so I think that's, uh, that's what happened. It was a real, uh, it was a permanent, I think, shift in the electorate that rejected a whole set of policies, even if they didn't articulate that, there was a long-term economic failure. In the United States, it was mainly a redistribution of income. In Latin America, it was mainly uh, actually a failure of economic growth. Uh, but in both cases, it was that long-term economic failure, I think, that really, uh, really uh, moved us. And so that's why I say there's no real going back. It was an experiment. It failed. Enough of the electorate realized it so that it's kind of it's kind of permanent. Yeah, I I agree ahead. with that. I think I think that um, in some of those Latin American countries, particularly in Bolivia, they um, the electorate not only uh, shifted but created a new kind of party that had a different kind of uh, base among indigenous and working people, um, rather than just another capitalist party. That's true. Um, I think. Um, um, Whereas in this country, we don't really have such a political party yet that has mass appeal. Um, well, if I can, do you want to keep going? Because I, I just want to, yeah. I, I wanted to point out that it is, it's not, you know, that's true for Bolivia, but, you know, every country was different. And that's some of true. the countries, uh, you didn't get a new yeah. Uh, yeah. political party. You didn't have the kind of social movement. It was more of a revolt at the ballot box. That's what happened in Venezuela. Right, right, right. Go ahead, keep going. And I, and I hear what you're saying, but... Um, what options there are at the ballot box is different in the U.S. than in other countries, and um, I, that's important to keep in mind. But I, I think, so our side is, is fighting back now, which is great, and I, I love the sign. I saw it was in Wisconsin a few months back, which said they, only, they call it class war when we start fighting back. Mm -hmm. um, that's very good. And I think that's important. But, I, but in terms of these two sides... The 1% is, I mean, they've realized that neoliberalism has failed as well, and they're trying to, they're still, they sort of have a neo-neoliberalism going on, and I don't want to talk about it too much, except to say that, that one thing you didn't mention, at least in this, these words, is austerity, and the policies around the globe of the, the I call them the ruling class, the, the 1% are, um, is austerity, um, you know, trying to even profitable companies like Verizon trying to um, do harm to their workers to improve their bottom line. And it's, it's you know, the, what's going on with, with teachers around the country and, um, and public sector unions especially, but, um, but private sector unions as well, and just and the, the postal workers. And, you know, all these uh, people are finding themselves under attack from... Um, the one percent, and the same thing's happening in Europe too, and people are really pissed about it and revolting about it. And I think our response to that, to, to fight back, is to um, partly is to occupy, which is fantastic, and I'm immensely excited that this movement is taking shape uh, as you described. But I think the, um, and this is sort of what I'm wondering about the, the role of you know their side is using austerity. So what does our side do? Occupy is one thing, but I think uh, my looking at the situation in history and at how Occupy Wall Street survived the first police raid is that solidarity with labor is is really pivotal, and um, having that because you know occupying a park is one thing, but actually you know imagine what would happen if the DC Metro just shut down for a week, you know the city would go crazy, and that 
happen if we have labor on our side. So well, I, I, I couldn't agree important. more with that. And I'm glad you mentioned both of those things, uh, austerity and labor. Uh, you know, labor played a huge part in the Egyptian revolution. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's gigantic. It's not so much recognized, but it's, it's true. Um, and that's still what the government there fears most, is, the, is organized labor. Uh, and uh, in terms of, you know, what they can get away with. And uh, I think, yeah, that's essential. Uh, I can't speak for the labor movement here, uh, but I'm sure you've had people here who will have more. Oh, yeah. We'll talk more about that. And, yeah, I think that's 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 going to be huge. Um, and the austerity, I, I'm also glad you mentioned that because that shows really the complete irrationality mm -hmm. of what these people are doing, what the 1% are doing both here and in, in Europe. You know, in Spain, where you have 21% unemployment, 16% yeah. increase. And they're shrinking these economies and making their debt problems worse. And, and you know, it's just a, a kind of a downward spiral. We didn't do as badly here, actually, in terms of the economic policy, as they are doing in Europe for various reasons. It's kind of ironic because, you know, Europe, you would think you have socialist parties, you have parties that call themselves socialist. Right. You have uh, you have a much bigger labor movement, and you have a much bigger welfare state, and yet their economic policy uh, since the crisis has been much more right wing uh, than the policy of the United States, yeah. which is quite amazing. It shows what happens, I think, when people don't uh, organize around those those economic issues. Uh, you can, you know, all kinds of terrible things can happen. And uh, so going forward, uh, we are looking at, you know, in the United States, we're right about now caught up with our level of income of four years ago. So that's, you know, more than a third of the way into a lost decade. And this, you know, at this rate of job creation, you know, we're going to have unemployment like this for decades. So something has to change. Uh, and that's the other reason I'm optimistic. I don't see people in this country standing for this. I really don't. Uh, you know, Japan had their lost decade, and uh, it wasn't as bad in the sense that their unemployment wasn't as high as here. But, yeah, I don't know Japan that well, but I do know this country some. And I do think that something's going to give. And that's, that's why, that's I think one of the reasons why this movement has, has gotten as much attention as it's gotten. And is, has as much potential as it does. Because what they're doing, is, is, it's worse than unsustainable. It's, it's really stupid. Uh, and it, it will have to give at some point. Go ahead, you had something. Does anyone else have anything to say? So, you know, Greece is paying 6.5% of its national income on, on debt. It's too much. That's just too big, but they can't afford that. You know, Jamaica is paying 13%. That's ridiculous. That's obscene, okay? That's not, that's going to blow. We're paying 1.4% of our national income on interest, net interest. 
That's the relevant measure if you want to know when we have a debt problem. Next time somebody tells you we have a debt problem, you say, ask them how much we're paying, how much the U.S. taxpayer are paying. <laughs> And then tell them it's 1.4%, and then you can tell them that's about as low as it's been in the whole post-World War II period. Then you realize we don't really have a debt problem in the United States. Uh, we have maybe a long-term debt problem in the future because health care costs, if they continue to increase at this rate, are explosive, okay? That's an unsustainable thing. But for this year, next year, three years, four years, five years, six years down the road, decade down the road, we're not really looking at what I would call a debt problem. And anybody who tells you you have that is really, uh, either doesn't really understand the arithmetic or is not being honest. Uh, I would say that. So I'm not particularly worried about the debt, especially at a time like this. Uh, now I have mixed feelings about saying that in a way because I do like the idea of cutting the military. And this seems to be the only chance we have to cut the military, or at least to slow the rate of growth of the military budget. So I empathize with all the people who are trying to cut the military and screaming about the debt. I, I'm not going to criticize them for doing that. But as an economist and somebody who's paid to tell the truth, <laughs> I have to tell you we don't really have a debt problem. Kind of going off you were saying, you know, some of the best parties in South America, you haven't used the word capitalism. That's the most important thing about it. Especially with the Labor Party. At this point, the labor movements in the states are, are so heavily intertwined with the Democratic Party and not pushing for more legitimate, legitimate, legitimate change in the way our economy and society functions. So I think this movie is trying to build. How do you see? I guess how do you see? I guess this space specifically, especially in the states, as opposed to Europe and as opposed to Latin America, where they the world socialism more any kind of notion of alternative economy is like kind of like that's not possible. That's not real. We can't discuss that. How would you discuss that in that kind of terms? Make people feel like okay, this is possible. I think it's hard. Yeah. Well, I think people take your word. More no, no, it's a very legitimate it. question. I mean, I don't know if you can all hear it, but Sorry, it's asking it about the yeah. question of capitalism and socialism. How does that fit or, in? Or not socialism. Just capitalism alternative itself. Economy. Yeah, alternative economy. Well, uh, you know, traditionally the alternative that's been put forward <laughs> for the last 150 years at least yeah. has been some kind of socialism. And in fact, the movements and the political parties on the left in Latin America are mostly socialist. And certainly the activists and the people who carry them forward. I mean, in Bolivia, that's the name of the party, the movement towards socialism. In, in, in Ecuador and Venezuela, they talk about 21st century socialism. Uh, you know, the reason I haven't said much about those issues is because I, you know, I think at this particular point in our history, uh, certainly in the United States, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with a capitalist system. And we're fighting essentially for reforms there. And by the way, I would say that about the Latin American governments too. You know, they may talk about socialism, but in reality they're struggling to figure out how to make a capitalist economy work better. And so, uh, without getting into the bigger, longer term strategic questions, you know, uh, I guess I would just say that we have a long way to go to just get the basic reforms that will move us forward. And then, I think when we get that, uh, these other questions will be closer to the agenda. But I'm not opposed to talking about it if people want to talk about it. I, you know, it's, you know, if you look at the social change that's taken place in the United States, all the social movements that I mentioned prior, the people who led those social movements, they didn't particularly like capitalism, you know, uh, including Martin Luther King. That's why the FBI hated him and hounded him until his death. 
so people that move, uh, people that these social movements have been built and built by, going back to the, the New Deal and the labor movement, uh, have always been full of people who they've always been led, people done the work at least, have, have always been socialists of one sort or another. Uh, and so, you know, it's only in this country, really, in the rich countries, that that's really a, a dirty word. Uh, <laughs> even if you go north of Canada, you find some different attitude. So, uh, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have two questions. One, I wonder what your thoughts are about the role that emerging economies like China and India play, especially I've heard the past couple of days about Europe thinking of asking China for a bailout. Yeah. Um, my other question is, is about dismantling empire in a sustainable way that doesn't involve, you know, violent revolution. British ended their empire. Uh, they, they've had lots of uh, tricky problems along the way. Okay, well, take the second question first. There's really, I don't think there's much of a problem with ending the empire. I mean, it's just, it's the easiest thing to do, really. <laughs> we shut down military bases. I mean, we had a big demobilization after World War II. You know, we had a whole war economy. Had uh, a lot more troops overseas, uh, and we managed that transition pretty well. There are a lot of people who thought there was going to be another Great Depression after the war, uh, and they had reason to fear. It. And there was a recession, and but overall, you know, we went from a war economy to a peacetime economy that was a period of broadly shared uh, prosperity in the United States, growth that trickled out. 30 years. So uh, I don't think we're going to have, I mean, this is much easier than the demobilization from World War II. So I think that it's going to be pretty easy when we do it and we'll get immediate benefits. The so called peace dividend that we were supposed to get at the end of the Cold War uh, back in 1990. And we'll get some of that. Um, the other question about emerging markets. That's a fascinating one to me. I've written about it, of course. Uh, the idea, it's almost like reading The Onion when you see that China and India and Brazil and South Africa, you know, the BRICS countries, are saying, how can we help to Europe, you know? Like, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, you know, these are not rich countries, even China, but especially India. Oh my God, you know, you imagine, there's no way that's going to happen because you know, India and Brazil are democracies, at least, and they're not going to, people wouldn't tolerate uh, their government giving large amounts of money to save people who are, you know, several times richer than them, trying to get their income. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's perverse. Europe doesn't need help. Europe just needs to do what it needs to do. They've got all the resources in the world to do it. They've got a European Central Bank that can print money just like our Federal Reserve printed two trillion dollars since the recession. And they're just too right-wing to do it. They're too right-wing to do what they need to do. It's their own stupidity. And nobody should come to their aid in that sense. China shouldn't do it. Better to, to offer the money to Greece and say, if you want to get out of this system and, and revive your economy, we'll make sure you don't run out of foreign exchange. That would be a great thing uh, for the countries with reserves, like China or Russia uh, or Brazil, to help the countries escape, or at least to go to the European authorities and say, look, if you don't give us another alternative to 16 or 20 percent unemployment, then we've got China here is going to loan us money, and we'll just leave the euro altogether. That's what they need. They don't need the BRICS countries to give money to the European Union so they can continue to impose austerity on the weaker eurozone economy. That's my short answer. All right.
Yeah. Um, could you talk about the recently passed trade agreements um, and like what we do now? <laughs> oh, this, the trade agreements like uh, South Korea and Colombia, Panama. Yeah. Well, I mean they're pretty much more of the same as far as I can tell. I haven't read through the details of the agreements. Um, but there are, you know, all of these agreements tended to go from the NAFTA mold. Uh, so obviously they're not good for either side because they're really written by the 1% for the 1%. And uh, what do we do about them? I think the same thing we need to do about the, you know, distribution of income and labor in general. We need a more powerful uh, union movement in this country, and you know the, the, the most basic structural reform that President Obama promised he would support when he ran for office, and then didn't, uh, was the uh, the uh, card check, basically the uh, forgetting the name of the uh, employee, free, yeah, the employee free choice act, the uh, which would allow workers to organize unions here without uh, being, you know, submarine by the process that they have to go through uh, right now. That is the campaign that, you know, basically you get 60% of the signatures and you have a union uh, instead of having to go through this election where the employer gets the threat of fire people and do all the things they do to prevent it from happening. And that would, uh, I think, open up the potential, you know, Jimmy Carter promised to support that back in the 70s and then didn't. And there's always been a chance of that uh, because the majority of people don't have a problem with it. And you got even, I think, a majority of House and Dems, and actually a majority of the House, I think, to support EFCA. And obviously that's not all the way there because powerful lobbies will oppose it. But that's the, that's the basic structural reform. I still think it's possible that we would need to uh, counteract the redistribution of income that's taking place through these uh, these trade agreements and other uh, structural counter reforms. Keith, uh, I think that there's a lot of confusion among us activists about um, questions that 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 are really uh, ideologically framed in the media. So I'm talking about. Uh, Federal Reserve printing money, uh, inflation, and uh, you know, and what's that effect on debt? And I was hoping that maybe you could explain to some of us who might you know feel uneasy about you know the Federal Reserve printing money, whatever that might mean, and why that and why in the examples that you've mentioned, like in Japan and so on, that's actually a beneficial thing in the face of a, a, a blockage on fiscal stimulus. Yeah. Okay. This gets into a little bit of economics, so I hope nobody falls asleep just yet. <laughs> well, if you can, yeah, if you can make it really simple on like what the purpose is of printing money, of inflation yeah. during this moment, what that so, means. So, you know, the standard ideology that you see in the press, well, first you see this whole thing that debt is a, is a big problem, right? It's going to explode and we're all going to go to hell and die, die first. And... Uh, the, um, and that's why I made a big point out of the interest burden because that's the really that's the best way to measure what the debt burden really is. People can use big numbers like 14 trillion or even percent of GDP. You know, you can say like Japan has a debt of 220 percent of GDP. Why aren't they collapsed now? That's you know more than twice any measure of our debt, gross debt, however you want to measure it. And the reason is that most of that debt about uh, over 100 percentage points of it is owed to the central bank. So the interest payments come back to the treasury. So it's not really like having debt. It's like you owe money to yourself. And so you understand that, that you have to distinguish between gross debt and net debt. So Japan doesn't have a problem because big, about half of their debt is owed to themselves. And second, their interest rates are very low. So their interest payments, even though their debt is 220% of GDP, 
Way more than Greece, which is at 166. How much is gross or net? That's gross. The net debt is about 110. Okay. So the net debt is still high, right? But the interest rates are low enough so that the interest burden is under 2% of their, their national income. So they don't really have a debt problem, despite having you know one of the largest gross debts in the world. If you lost debt, they owe the money to themselves. Well, OK. <laughs> How does that happen? Well, Bernanke did a bunch of this in the past uh, uh, few years. What you can do is, the central bank can create money. That was the other question you want. And like, if you, again, if you listen to the right wing or to most of the media, they think of creating money as causing inflation. But in a time like this, when there's so much capacity that's not being used, so much unemployment, uh, when you print money, you don't necessarily create any inflation at all. And that's why I said the Fed has created two trillion dollars, and it, since they started uh, their quantitative easing, it's called, and it hasn't really given us any inflation problem here, and it's almost certainly not going to. And Japan created the equivalent of 15 trillion over those 20 years from 1920, 1990 to 2010, that 20 year period. They were creating trillions of dollars of money and spending it. And their inflation over the whole 20 years was only 5%, not 5% annually, but 5% over 20 years, okay? So the idea that printing money leads to inflation necessarily is just not true. It's something that the right wing promotes, partly because they believe it, because they don't understand economics, but partly because they don't want the government to do it. Because if they're going to print money, they're going to spend it, and they're, they're against that, in general, unless it's on the military. <laughs> and so uh, that's how you owe it to yourself. If the central bank uh, creates the money, and loans it to the Treasury, then the Treasury, you know, the government can go out and spend that money, and the money is owed to the Central Bank of the United States. So when they pay interest, that comes right back to the Treasury. We have a huge chunk of interest right now that is coming back to Treasury, uh, and uh, yeah, coming back to the, yeah, coming back to the Treasury from the Central Bank. And that's significant. So Bernanke is really trying to do the right thing. What he's doing, and it's quite surprising. I mean, he's a Republican, and he's you know not very progressive as an individual necessarily. But as a central banker and somebody who studied the Great Depression uh, for his academic work, he understands that it's necessary in this a time like this and desirable to create money. The problem is that the rest of the government isn't smart enough to use that and, and, and spend it. And, uh, and that's, why, uh, that's why we're stuck. But the central bank is, is really, uh, to a large extent at least, doing its part, much more than the central bank in Europe, which is controlled by people that really make uh, Bernanke look like a socialist. They're very far right. And that is Europe's biggest problem right now. So uh, I hope that explains a little bit. But so, the U so the U.S. government would take that money that's printed by the central bank and then spend it on what? On, on building infrastructure? Yes. Yeah. All the things that we need right now that would create jobs, that would uh, move the economy towards a, a more energy efficient economy. They could do that too. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, but they don't. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. I, I can't give you, a, you know, uh, an answer to that. Go ahead. Okay.
yeah. what, and what that motivation is coming from. Because I just don't understand it. It doesn't seem like the issue to me. But maybe it's me really... Yeah, basically, because I don't... Because we have folks in this camp that are like kind of pushing that. Right, you know, right. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't really Okay, well, I can't speak for the, you know, crank monetary theories that well, because I can't represent them. But I have some idea what they believe. And, you know, there's a, and this is popular in the United States, so it's not a trivial question. There's probably more people who believe that stuff than believe what we believe uh, in terms of uh, monetary theory. In other words, you have a lot of people who believe that they never got used to the idea that central banks can print money they, they, they think that the gold standard was a better system because money was backed by gold. And it's just intuitive feel for them. I remember when I was first studying economics, I thought, how can you have money that's really not backed by anything? You know, how is that? It's not intuitive, actually. There's the idea that money is backed by gold is more intuitive than most people. And that's why they have this appeal. Because they say, well, we, we went off the gold standard. And now money's not real. And, and so the central bank can just print it, and there are intuitive arguments that the central bank just prints money that we're just going to end up with inflation, and we're going to all be screwed. That's the basic theory. And, uh, but the fact is, uh, money doesn't have to be backed by gold or anything else. It's, it's just backed by the, you know, the, what it says, I think, somewhere, full faith and credit of United States government, that's enough. And, uh, you know, inflation is not our problem. We don't have an inflation problem in the United States. Uh, we haven't had an inflation problem, you know, since the late 70s and early 80s when it went into double digits. And even then, there was nothing really that serious. You know, uh, inflation has to get really high before it's a serious problem. And uh, so, the situation we're in now, we have the opposite problem. We're, 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 inflation is actually too low uh, for the economy to function at its best. And uh, we would be better off if there was higher inflation. There's even economists, you know, they're taking it back now, but the chief economist of the, of the IMF, Olivier Blanchard, wrote a paper saying maybe central banks should target a 4% inflation rate, uh, which is higher than we have now and uh, much wider than we've had for the last few years. And uh, because that would make it easy, that would relieve some of the debt burden, right? When you have inflation, if anybody here's got a student loan, and, you know, you would be a lot better off if there was higher inflation because you're paying back in, in dollars that are worth a little bit less than the ones that you borrowed. And so inflation tends to help debtors at the expense of creditors. That's one of the reasons why the right wing hates inflation so much, because they tend to be allied with Wall Street and creditors. And that's why I say it's impressive that Bernanke is doing what he's doing, because the Fed has traditionally been allied with the creditors. And he's not going so far as to say, let's target 4% inflation, because it's still the Fed. <laughs> and they're still close to Wall Street. But he's done much more, as I said, than, than, than other central banks have done. And so, uh, um, so the people who are worried about inflation right now and are worried about the Fed, think you have to get rid of the Fed, they're just barking up the wrong tree. Uh, on the other hand, they're not completely wrong in the sense that, that if I want to take the little bit of truth to their argument, uh, the Fed is kind of an unaccountable institution. And so, uh, and it's not transparent as it should be. And so you did see a, a big alliance last year. Uh, I have no good memory for time, so it could have been the year before, but I think it was last year. Um, you had an alliance between Ron Paul and uh, a lot of the Republicans with the left in Congress to force through legislation that made the Fed more accountable. They had to put more information on where their loans were going. And that was very good. So I'm not going to throw, well, I don't throw Ron Paul out the window uh, because he's also in agreement with us on foreign policy, and to me that's very important. I would actually vote for him in a Republican primary if we have that chance, um, because just, on, just because what he says about 
the empire is so completely true that it's very important that that voice be there, even if the stuff he says about the domestic economy is, is all wrong. Um, and so I think it's good to be tolerant and patient with people who have uh, theories that don't necessarily make sense. <laughs> um,